before Einstein came along, space and time were fixed. They were absolute. They were given to us by Sir Isaac Newton. And they, they didn't do anything. They were just the background on which physics happens. And then when Einstein comes along, he says that you know what you and I think of as gravity is actually rising because space and time change. They're flexible. They're dynamical. They can be curved. They can bend. And this opens up a whole new universe of possibilities. And one of the possibilities is that there can be shortcuts through space and through time. And so that's really just what a wormhole is. It's taking advantage of the fact that you can bend space and time in arbitrary ways. So you just warp the space in between two points to regions of space that look like they're very far apart from the outside world. But there's a shortcut through them because there's a little tube they can be very, very short, even though it connects these two regions that are very far away. Now, do you need an, a huge mass to warp the space? Well, the honest answer is you can't do it. <laughs> uh, sure you can, because check it out. Check it out. There's, there's out. A <laughs> photograph of it. There. There's data. Um, <laughs> the thing is that we can talk about what it would be like if you could do it. And general relativity is a very flexible, uh, pun not intended, theory. It lets you talk about all sorts of things that can happen because what it says is, given these kinds of energy, this is how space and time would react. So for a wormhole, you need kinds of energy that we don't know how to produce. It's not a matter of how much energy. In fact, it's not even a lot of energy. It's a negative amount of energy. Ah. We don't know how to do that. The embarrassing fact is that we don't know whether you can make wormholes or not. Because general relativity, as good as it is, Einstein, smart guy, going places. But uh, <laughs> he's not the final word on how gravity works. We don't understand the ultimate laws of physics, so maybe they will allow us to do that. So it gives science fiction writers hope and a tool to use. So why don't you tell us about that? Every science fiction writer who wants to get out of the solar system <laughs> in fewer than you know months or years Gloms on, gloms on to that, or some variation of that, because it's it's you know, it's the cheat, or it's the maybe you know, it's it's the leap of faith right. that uh, that lets you tell stories on this bigger canvas. In our case, the nine realms, whatever uh, whatever you want to call them, the Vikings in space, uh, the Vikings in space. Now, when, so when you're writing uh, writing science fiction. You, which you have done a lot of, I understand, right? You've yeah, my partner and I seem to be doing that a lot. Yes. You, tr when you can, do you try and incorporate realistic or at least you know, borderline theoretical stuff that makes, gives it a sense of, of possibility as much as you can? Yeah, absolutely, because uh, when Ash and I approach science fiction, when we're, when we're writing screenplays, we view science and the laws of physics and things like that where, where we can as rules okay. and as limits. And rules and limits are what you produce drama from. If your superhero doesn't have limits on what he can do or she can do, then anything can happen. Right. But if all of a sudden you, you're putting limitations on where they can go, how much they can lift, how fast they can go, that that causes vulnerabilities and that causes that causes places where they can't do things. And right. that's where you get excitement and dramatic scenes from. I mean, you've already illustrated with these so-called realistic heroes right. that, uh, that really, when you come down to it, a space viking with a flying hammer <laughs> is really not any less realistic than, uh, than a guy who doesn't get reduced to a pulp each time he comes to well, a stop. You, you can make a case for that, yes. Um, you know, and that was the big challenge when, mm -hmm. when Ash and I were brought on board, and it was, it was okay, you need to integrate Thor into the bigger Marvel universe because we're building towards the Avengers and how do you do that given the cosmic nature of right. that and the kind of tools that, that Sean is talking about, Einstein, Rosenbridge, using physics and using that great Arthur C. Clarke uh, quote that we, uh, that we paraphrased and abused, um, any, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic mm -hmm. is a great hand wave because a as, as you pointed out, Things that we take for granted now to people a thousand years ago would have looked like wizardry and magic and things like that. So we don't have to explain how Thor's hammer works. Does it have a little motor inside of it? Or <laughs> no, it was it was forged in the heart of a dying star. Yeah, I think Anthony Hopkins, you know, by dwarves. A neutron star.